All right, so I'm just gonna go through a handful of examples in the hopes of preparing you for the chapter eight test. So starting from 8.1, what you do with 8.1 is you cross cancel, you can reduce, lots of factoring and things like that. So I'm gonna give you a handful of examples. So here's the first one. So these are some examples from 8.1. Okay, so the first thing you do when you're looking at an example like this is you factor everything down and you factor it as much as you possibly can. One thing that people forget about all the time when they're factoring is the possibility of factoring out a GCF. So there's usually two ways that things factor. So this one in the upper left factors the more typical way, I guess, that people usually think of is where it factors like this, like an X times X. Okay, so this, you're trying to figure out what multiplies to 4 and adds to 5, and that would be a positive 4 and a positive 1. And then the denominator, this one factors the typical way to x times x, and we're trying to multiply to 1 and add to 2, and that would be plus 1 plus 1. Um, in the upper right, people miss this all the time. They think that it doesn't factor just because it doesn't factor like this, but if you look, there's a GCF. You can factor out a 2, and when you divide both these terms by 2, 2x, if you factor out a 2, you're left with just an x, and 2, if you factor out a 2, you're left with 1. And then the denominator, that doesn't factor. It doesn't factor in the traditional way, and there's no GCF between x and 4. So we write it like that. And then the next step is the most important step, because you're simplifying down. So if you can find one common term in one of the numerators and one of the denominators, you can cancel. What people mess up all the time is like these, you can't cancel these. Just because you see two of something doesn't mean you can cancel them. But you could cancel these, or you could cancel these. And so everything has canceled except for a two. So this answer is just two. Okay, um, let's look at another example. Something else that people forget about all the time is the division idea. Um, so let's look at a second example, and this will give us a good example of the other way that you could see these written. Okay, there's so much division happening here. Okay, so with these ones, this is a second example. You take this, so this is like the numerator and then you're dividing it by this. So remember what the division thing does is it's like multiplying by the reciprocal. So you take this piece right here, that first piece that I kind of bracketed in, I'm sorry, that's a squared, and then divided by this, which means you're multiplying by the reciprocal. Okay, so instead of taking this and dividing it by this, we're taking this and multiplying by the reciprocal of this, which means you flip. Numerator and denominator trade places. So now we factor, and we factor as much as we possibly can. So in the numerator, um, this is the difference of squares, but before we do the difference of squares, we're going to factor out a GCF. So there's a 4, and then we're left with a C squared minus 9 once we factor out that 4. In the denominator, uh, remember this is a squared, I'm sorry about that, there's an 8c in common, so we can factor out an 8c, and that leaves us with a c minus 6, oops, 3, sorry, my goodness, times, and then up here I can factor out a 2 and a c, and then I'm left with a c minus 3, and then down here in the denominator I can factor out a 12, when I factor out a 12, I'm left with a C plus 3. So we are just about done factoring. I just have to factor this piece right here. That's the difference of squares. That's another really good pattern to know. So C squared minus 9, it is C minus 3, C plus 3. So I'm just going to scribble this out. I'm replacing it with this, C minus 3, C plus 3. So first of all, I have a C minus 3 that can cancel with this C minus 3. This C plus 3 can cancel with this C, th C plus 3. And then I have lots of other little pieces that can cancel. So like this C can cancel with this C. Um, the 4 and 12 I could reduce down. So I have, actually if you look right here, 4 times 2 is 8. And then right here I have an 8. So this 4 times 2 cancels with this 8. That's probably the quickest way to do it. So what's left over? Let's see. I have this. 
and this. Everything else is canceled. All right, so I have a C minus three, and then in the denominator I have a 12. This part, super tempting, super illegal. People try to reduce this three over 12. You cannot, absolutely cannot do that. If all three of these had a common factor, then you could reduce it down. But this is one unit, can't break it apart into little bits and pieces, and the subtraction is the difference. If it's addition or subtraction, you can't break it apart into little bits and pieces. But this C right here was okay to cancel because it wasn't part of a polynomial. So this is your final answer. Okay, so that's your 8-1 stuff. 8-1, you're multiplying, dividing, basically a lot of factoring and canceling. So now let's look at 8-2. Eight, 8-2 two. Eight, two was multiplying, I'm sorry, adding and subtracting. So let's look at a couple of examples here. So this is a good one. Okay, so with the addition and subtraction, what I want to walk you through is kind of a process that works every single time. So what I want you to do is first factor down the denominators. Okay, so if the denominators can be factored or need to be factored, start there. So this first one... That's n squared minus 9. That's the difference of squares. We just saw something really similar. That would factor to n minus 3, n plus 3, and then minus 3 over. Now, n plus 3 is already factored. There's nothing further that you could do with that. In these types of problems, do not forget about the possibility of a GCF. GCF could absolutely happen. People forget about it all the time. Okay, so now our next step is to figure out what the LCD is because I can't currently subtract them. I can multiply and divide anything I want, but I can't subtract things unless they have a common denominator. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. So my LCD, when I try to find it, remember one thing to keep in mind is that denominators can't ever get smaller. They can get bigger, but they can't ever get smaller. So my LCD has to be at least as big as this denominator and at least as big as this denominator. I can add things to it, but I can't remove things. So let's just start with this denominator. So I know it needs to be at least as big as this. So it needs all the pieces that this denominator has, and it needs all the pieces that this denominator has. But if you look, it already has this piece. So I don't need to add anything else. If I added it, it would be too big, and it would no longer be the least common denominator. All right, so that's my next step, is I look at the two factors, and I figure out what's the least common denominator, keeping in mind that they can only get bigger. You can't remove things. So it needs to be at least as big as both of these denominators. At least It needs to have at least what these have, maybe more. The next step is you figure out what's missing. You convert them into what I call equivalent expressions, which means you basically multiply in whatever the denominator doesn't have so that it can be the LCD. So if you look at this term right here, this denominator already is the LCD. It's perfect, it's wonderful, all I'm going to do is rewrite this, it gets to stay exactly the same because it already has the denominator that I want. And then minus, now this one's missing something. It has this, but it doesn't have this. And in order to have the right denominator, it needs this. So let me start with what I have right here. And then what you're going to do is you're going to multiply in what's missing. But it's totally illegal to just multiply the denominator, so you also multiply the numerator, and that way you're just multiplying by like a fancy 1. n minus 3 over n minus 3 is really just 1. And then I start to combine up like terms. So what I have is, like I'm going to, let me rewrite this thing right here. I distribute 3 times n minus 3. And I get this. So this whole thing right here. I'm rewriting it as this. Okay, so now I have this thing minus this thing. And now notice they have the exact same denominator, so now it's totally a fair game to just subtract them. So be very, very careful. I have 6n minus 3n. That gives me 3n when I combine like terms. But then I have no constants over here minus a negative 9, so plus. Now here's something that's actually a little bit unusual. I can actually keep simplifying. If you look at this numerator right here, you can factor out a 3. That's the GCF. So I'm going to factor out a 3. That'll leave me with n plus 3. And if you look, there's actually a common factor. So since these factors are exactly the same, I can cancel them down. It'll leave me with a 3 in the numerator and an n minus 3 in the denominator. Remember, canceling these would be completely illegal and you wouldn't even dream of it. So that is your final answer. For that. So 8, 2, we just saw a lot of that, a lot of addition and subtraction. So your steps are basically, you know, finding a common denominator, 
getting, you know, getting the, the LCD, either of monomials or polynomials, and then turning each one into something that has that same denominator. All right, um, so let's take a look at an example from 8.3. Okay, so 8.3, we started graphing these kind of simple, I suppose, these simple rational expressions, rational equations. So 8.3, we called them reciprocal functions, and so it was like the easier type that we started to do first. And so you could have something like this. Okay, so that's the reciprocal function, where you have a constant over a linear term and then a constant out here. Okay, so we talked about a handful of things with these. Vertical asymptotes is whenever the denominator would be equal to zero. So if you set x plus 2 equal to zero, you would get negative 2. The horizontal asymptote is whatever number is floating out here. So that's a horizontal line at negative 4. Okay, so let's set this up. So a vertical asymptote at negative 2, draw in your little dotted line here. Horizontal asymptote at negative 4, so draw in a horizontal line there. Now the next thing you're looking at is this 3. It's positive, and so this is more of like the standard graph where it goes in the lower left-hand corner and the upper right-hand corner. If it were upside down, if that were a negative, then you would have a piece here and a piece here. All right. Um, they'll also ask you for domain and range. Domain is any x value except the vertical asymptote, and the range is any y value except the horizontal asymptote. So if you can find the asymptotes, it's really easy to find domain and range, and vice versa. Okay, so that's 3, or I'm sorry, 8, 3. 8, 3 was pretty straightforward. Um, it was basically just graphing those. Then we moved on to 8, 4. In 8, 4, we had a lot of different rules, so I want to walk you through those rules because you could see a number of different types of equations on there. So 8, 4, I'm going to walk you through the steps. So 8, 4, step 1 was to find the x-intercepts, and that's by setting the numerator equal to 0. Okay, step two was to find the asymptotes. And we had different rules for different asymptotes. Um, so let's say letter A, the vertical asymptote. You do that by setting the denominator equal to zero. The horizontal asymptote follows one of three rules. Okay, so here are your three rules. If the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, there is no horizontal asymptote. If the degree of the numerator was equal to the degree of the denominator, then you take the ratio of their leading coefficients. And if the degree of the numerator was smaller, then the horizontal asymptote is just zero. Okay, third type of asymptote was our oblique asymptotes. This only happens if the degree of the numerator is one more, exactly one more. Um, and if that's the case, then you do some long division. Okay, then once all of that is happening, you've got your intercepts, you've got your asymptotes, then you can just use a calculator to finish the graph. All right, so we will walk through that process. So let me give you a couple of different ones here. So let's start with this one. Okay, so we're going to walk through our three steps. So step one, we want to find x-intercepts by setting the numerator equal to zero. Okay, so we get negative three. That's my x-intercept. So I'll start with that. Boom, boom. So it's going to hit right there, a negative three. Step two is I am going to um, find my asymptotes. So I'm going to start, I'm going to factor this down. That's probably a good first step to take. Okay, so I factor this down, so I'm trying to multiply to 6 and add to 5. Okay, so to multiply to 6, that would be 3 times 2, and that adds to 5. Oh, okay, so this is a good example. So here, you have something that cancels. So x actually can't be negative 3. There's going to be a hole there. So wipe what I just had, for example, 1 here. So this is going to be exactly like this equation. It's going to look just like that, except when x is negative 3. I'm going to have a hole there, okay? So we'll deal with that when it comes. So for the first one, since the numerator is 1, 1 will never be 0, so there's no x-intercept. So let's just pretend that never happened there. 
Step two, you're going to find your vertical asymptotes. So the vertical asymptote of this, you set the denominator equal to zero, so we get negative two. So start with our vertical asymptote. And then when we're trying to graph the rest of this, so then horizontal asymptote, the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree, I'm sorry, the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator. So my horizontal asymptote is zero. So you can't really see it through the axis, but it's right there. And then my whole, you would have a whole when x equals 3, negative 3. Okay, so attempt to plug it in. So 1 over negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. So you have a whole at negative 3, negative 1. Okay, so right there you're going to have a hole. But other than that, it looks exactly like this graph would look. So it's going to come through here. There would be a hole right there. And then it would come just like this. All right, so that one looks something like that. So that's one example of the process. Um, let me find another good one. <laughs> I'm going to find one with an oblique asymptote. Well, here's a good one here that we could do. This one's not an oblique asymptote, but this is a good example. Okay, so step number one, to find x-intercepts, you set the numerator equal to zero. And so it's just x equals zero. So I hit the x-axis right there. For step two, my vertical asymptote, I set the denominator equal to zero, and I get negative two. For my horizontal asymptote, the degrees are equal. I have x to the first, x to the first, so I take the ratio, one over one, which is one. So that's my horizontal. And then you would use the calculator to find the rest. And I can give you, just a little spoiler alert, the calculator will give you a graph that looks like this. Okay, so that's an example of a different horizontal asymptote. Um, we haven't seen very many examples of that, so that's a good one. Um, let's look at, and I'm trying to find one that would have an oblique asymptote. Yeah, I'll just make one up here. Okay, so one that would have an oblique asymptote. Let's just take like an x squared over x minus 3 or something like that. Okay, so step one, you find the x-intercepts by setting the numerator equal to 0. And if you square rooted both sides, we just get 0. So we know it's going to hit right there. Step number two is to find your asymptotes. Your vertical asymptote, you set the denominator equal to 0. So we get 3. Horizontal asymptote, since the numerator has a bigger degree, there's no horizontal asymptote. But since the numerator's degree is exactly one more than the denominator, there could be an oblique asymptote. So I take the numerator and I divide it by the denominator. So I want to see how many times x goes into x squared. Or in other words, what do you multiply x by to get x squared? And that would be an x. So I set up my subtraction, I'm super careful with parentheses, and I multiply back in x times x is x squared, and then x times negative 3x. So careful here, minus a negative leaves me with 3x, and there's nothing to bring down. How many times does x go into 3x? Or in other words, what do I have to multiply by? And that would be 3. Set up and subtract, distribute the 3. My remainder is 9, because I have minus a negative. Again, careful with that. X does not divide into 9, so I'm done. Remember with the oblique asymptote, we only consider just that top part there. No remainder. So I graph this as my oblique asymptote. So I go up to a y-intercept of 3, and then I'm going to go up one to the right one. I could go down one to the left one, and then sketch in my oblique asymptote. Looks like that. Okay, then remember what I had you doing here is you are just using a calculator to graph the rest of this. So once you have the intersection, you've got the two vertical asymptotes, I'm sorry, the vertical asymptote and the oblique asymptote, you can just plug the rest of it in. So let's plug in our function x squared over x minus 3. It's going to look something like this. So we can see this part right here. Kind of drags along here, hits this point, hits that point, and then comes down along here. 
We may or may not be missing a piece, so make sure you zoom out because it looks like there should be a piece in here. So hit menu, window zoom, and you can zoom out. So let's zoom out a little. Let's see, click. There we go, so there is a piece up there. So it'd be hard to see, but if I extended my window a little bit, I do have a piece up there. Okay, so that's a good amount of stuff that we've seen for graphing. Uh, so that's 8.4. We then moved on to 8.5, and 8.5 was the variation. We had direct variation, joint variation, compounds variation, and inverse variation. Um, so lots of different setups there. So for direct variation, if they say that y varies directly as x, you would set this up. Okay, for joint, if they say that y varies jointly with x and z, you would set up this. If they say that y varies inversely with x, you would set this up. And if there's a compound variation, meaning like a nice little mix, if they say y is varying directly with x and inversely with z, you'd set it up like that. Oops, two. Okay, so basically, when they say like y varies or a varies or q varies or whatever they say first, that's the one that goes right here. Y varies, y varies, y varies. So if it's an A, you'd put that there. If it's anything else, you'd put that there. And then if it says directly as, that goes in the denominator. So if it's joint, they're both direct. If it's compound, this one was direct. And then if you say inversely as, that one gets multiplied. So like this one, again, was Y varies directly as X and inversely as Z. So I'll find one example, um, and we can set up a good you know, typical one of these. Um, I want to find, let's see, maybe some joint variation. Let's just do, let's do inverse. Okay, so let's say if A varies inversely as B, and A equals 12 when B equals 6, find A when B equals 8. Okay, so A varies. So that means that A is going here inversely as B, so it gets multiplied. So it's going to be A times B, so like A1, B1 equals A2, B2. Okay, so let's plug those in. So we know A equals 12 when B equals 6, Find A when B equals 8. So 12 times 6 is 72. And then to get A by itself, we divide both sides by 8. And so we get 9. So remember, the inverse relationship means as one goes up, the other goes down. So here, A is 12 and B is 6. B goes up, so A goes down. But this would be your final answer. Just the value of A or X or Y or whatever it is they're looking for. Okay, so that's 8.5. As long as you have these formulas memorized and you know how to use them, I think you will be absolutely fine with, uh, with 8.5. Then the last thing we did was 8.6. These were the equations and inequalities, so I'm going to give you one example of each. So here's a good example for the equations. Okay, so with the equations, the first thing we need to do is find the LCD. And so if there's any factoring that needs to happen, we want to do that. So this doesn't need to be factored, this doesn't need to be factored, but this does. There's a GCF there. So factor out a 2, and you're left with x minus 3. So I'm going to scratch this out. I've replaced it with the factored version. So my LCD. Remember, my LCDs, they can only get bigger, they can't get smaller. And with these, with the equations, your goal is to get all the denominators to cancel. So keep those straight. When you're adding or subtracting, your goal is to get the same denominator so that you can combine them. If you're doing equations, your goal is to cancel the denominators. Okay, very big difference, huge difference between expressions and equations. So the LCD here, we want to make sure everything cancels. So look at the plain old numbers first. 3 and 2. In order to get a 3 and 2 to cancel, you need to multiply by 6, and then you need an x minus 3. 
So that is your LCD. So the way that the equations work is you're going to multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD. Okay, so multiply by the LCD, multiply by the LCD, and what ends up happening is you distribute. So you distribute it here, you distribute it here. So I'm going to write, so I'm going to switch ink. So I'm going to write everything out like this. I'm going to multiply everything by the LCD. Okay, so this first term gets multiplied by the LCD. Next term gets multiplied by the LCD. And the whole right-hand side gets multiplied by the LCD. So the important step is the canceling. So what I just said is that you're trying to get everything to cancel. So that's what we do here. So the x minus 3s will cancel. Here the 3 will cancel because 6 over 3 reduces down, leaving us with a 2. And then here the x minus 3s will cancel and the 6 over 2 reduces down to 3. Okay, so let's simplify everything we've got. So here I have this, 2x times 6, that's 12x. Here be very, very careful with this. This is a negative 2 times an x minus 3. So negative 2x and then plus 6 because it's a negative 2 times a negative 3 equals, and then all I have left here is a 6. Okay, combine up like terms. I have 10x plus 6 equals 6. I'm going to try to get x by itself. So I subtract from both sides. I get 10x equals 0. And so last step, I divide both sides by 10. So I end up with 0. We want to do a quick extraneous check every time. So try to plug the 0 back in. 0 minus 3, that's totally fine. 0 minus 3, totally fine. You'd be checking to see if anything gave you a denominator of 0. Um, this, I'm confident of my algebra, so I'm not going to plug it into my calculator. If you're not sure if you got it right or wrong, I would definitely plug it into your calculator and do a true-false check. Okay, um, 8, 6, next example, last example, is an inequality. And these ones we've got really a, a, a different method than what we just did, but similar. Okay. So there's our inequality example. So step one, step one that I gave you guys is to write what you cannot plug in. So here, if we plugged in a zero, this would give me a denominator of zero. So I know x can equal zero. Here, if I plugged in zero, I would get a denominator of zero. So I already have that here. Here, nine can't be zero, no matter what you try to do. So x just can't be zero, because that would give me a denominator of zero here and here, and that would be undefined. Step two, what I wrote down for you in the notes, I wrote to solve the related equation. So write this as if it were an equation and then do the same thing that we did up above to solve it. Okay, so write it as if it's an equation. Now take a look at my denominators. Okay, so my LCD, it definitely needs to have an X so that these X's will cancel. We need a number that's gonna make the six and the three and the nine cancel. So the LCD of six and three and nine is 18. Think about that for a second, absorb it, make sure you believe it. Six goes into it, three goes into it, nine goes into it, but it's not too big. So just like up above, I am going to multiply everything by an 18x. And then I'm going to reduce. So 6x with an 18x, this reduces down to 3. 18x over 3x reduces down to 6. And then here, 18 over 9 reduces down to 2, but I still have the x. Be careful there. So here I have 3 times 1, which is 3, plus 6, plus, or 6 times 2, which is 12, equals 2 times x times 5, which is 10x. Okay, so 3 and 12, I get 15 equals 10x. And finally, I divide both sides by 10. So 15 divided by 10 is 3 halves, or 1.5. Okay, so step one, find what I'm not allowed to plug in. That's my asymptote, basically. Step two, solve the related equation. So replace this with an equal sign and solve. Step three, I set up a number line and do some test values. Okay, so zero and then 1.5. And then I'm going to do three different test values, something here, here, and here. So I can test three different values, whatever I want. So here, anything less than zero, I'm going to test a negative 57, I think. In the middle will be boring. I'll test 1, something in between 0 and 1.5. And then something bigger than 1.5, let's go 10.3. You can test anything you want. Okay, of course, we could be boring and do negative 1, 1, and 2, 
whatever. Okay, so here's what you do. You take your first value, whatever you've chosen, and store it in as x, just like that, and then you plug in the original inequality. Make sure you have the correct inequality symbol and everything. So set this up, so 1 over 6x plus 2 over 3x, and then the inequalities hit control and then the equal sign, and we're going to start with a less than, so less than 5 ninths, test it out, we get true. So this region right here gave us a true. Anything you test in there would give you true. So now take one. Store that in as x. We're going to test this one now. And then you just copy and paste the inequality. Okay, so paste it. Check it. We get a false. Doesn't mean we did anything wrong. It just means that our test value made the inequality false. And then last one, check the 10.3 or anything you want that's bigger than 1.5. And then one last time, arrow up paste and check and we get a true. So this region right here we get true. So what you're trying to do is now rewrite these two. So this area worked and this area worked. So these right here, these are all the numbers that are smaller than zero. So write x is less than zero or and then these are all the numbers bigger than 1.5. So that's x is greater than 1.5. Now always check since this is just a less than, you don't have the or equal twos here. Okay, so that's your final answer. One quick little note, even if this did have an or equal to, this couldn't because you know here that you can't equal zero, but this could. So be very careful of that if there's an or equal to. Okay, so I think you got everything covered. Um, hopefully this helps. Feel free to come in for some extra help if you need it.